Thanks to Envato Elements for sponsoring this video. For more information, check the affiliate link in the description. Hello everyone and welcome back to the logo animation series. From this tutorial onwards, we'll do one logo at a time, that way we can focus more on the details with each logo animation that we do. Today's episode was actually suggested by a viewer and I ended up using the original Xbox One startup as reference. So make sure to leave your comments down below with your logo animation suggestions and that way you'll have a chance to get featured in a future episode. With that out of the way, let's jump right in and get started. All right, so here we are now in After Effects and we'll go ahead and start by creating a new composition and rename it to Xbox Tut for tutorial, resolution of 1080p and a frame rate of 60 because we want that smooth gaming look and then a duration of 10 seconds. Now let's hit okay. Now, before we continue with After Effects, I actually wanna jump over to Illustrator because it's much easier to work with vector layers there. And once we have everything set up, we can bring them back into After Effects for animation. All right, so I'm gonna make sure to leave the link to this logo in the description. So once you grab it and open it up, this is what you'll see. Over here on the layers panel, we're gonna go ahead and start cleaning things up a bit. So first of all, there's this sort of box we don't need. So we're gonna delete that and then bring these two layers outside and we'll rename this to Xbox. And then finally, we'll select both of these and go over to object, compound path and release because there's a bunch of layers that would merge together. And this way, when we release them, we have every single layer on its own layer. But with that, we've actually messed up the B and O letters. So let's go ahead and select all of those shapes and then go over to the Pathfinder and just click the minus front option. That way we cut holes back inside of the B letter and do the same thing for the O. Then let's go ahead and rearrange these, do X, which one is that? That's the first one, this is the last one. And then there's this sort of empty point here, we'll just delete that. And then we have all of these shapes, which we're gonna go ahead and actually make into a compound path again. You can do that by going over to the object, compound path, make, or use the control H shortcut. And that way we have four shapes inside of one. So let's name this to icon, and we'll do X, B, O, X. Then down here on the artboards, these are basically your compositions. So we can click on this icon, let's rename it to Xbox, and then let's set the resolution to 1920 by 1080, which is what we're gonna use in After Effects. By the way, you can hit Control zero to fit the canvas to your view. Now, before we move on, I actually wanna bring in the original Xbox logo icon. It's on my second monitor, so I'll just click and drag it over here. And if you click on the corner, you can hold down shift to scale it down proportionally and also hold down alt to scale it down symmetrically. And then bring it over here and we'll lock it so it's there. We can come back to it later on when we need it. What I wanna do now is somehow extract the X shape that is inside of the circle. That way we can assign gradients as you see here in the original logo. So first step is to grab the circle tool or the ellipse tool, I guess is what it's called. And then we'll just click somewhere in the middle here, doesn't matter for now. Hold down Alt again to scale it symmetrically and hold down Shift for proportional scaling. Go ahead and give it another color. Let's go with red. And before I go ahead and adjust the size of this again, I'm just gonna make sure that this ellipse is right in the center of this shape. So with the ellipse selected, hold down Control and then target or select the icon as well. And then over here in the Align tab, if you don't see that, by the way, you can go over to Window, align and that should reveal it. And there's an option here that says align to key object, which if we select that, you can see this thicker outline pops up. And with that enabled, if you have two or more objects selected, you can actually target which one you want to align things to. So in this case, I wanna align the circle to the icon. So we select the icon itself and then we go horizontal align center and then horizontal align vertical. Now we can just select the ellipse and then hold down Alt and Shift again and we'll just scale it up. Zoom in right in there, just to make sure that it's very well aligned. Let's see down here at the bottom. Yep, that's pretty much perfect. Now, before we do anything else, I just wanna make a duplicate of the ellipse. So you can click and drag that onto the new layer icon. We'll shut off the original and then select the icon layer as well as the ellipse and then go over to the Pathfinder 
and just click on this exclude button. Now, because we didn't get a perfect cutout, we are now left with a group. And inside of that group, we can see a bunch of random shapes. So we'll select the first one, go down here, hold down shift and select the last one, which will select everything in between. And then just scroll back up until you see the preview of like the main shape, which is the X right over here. And then hold down control and deselect that. And that way we can delete everything else that we don't need and then bring that out of the group. We'll also rename it to X. Now the top side here is fine, but we can see at the bottom side, we still have these sort of glitches going on. So we need to fix these points. And we'll do P for the pen tool and we'll just click and drag just to make like a shape. And then we'll zoom out like so. We gotta select the anchor so we can continue our mask. And then we'll do the same over here somewhere, just create a shape. I'll select the X and then the other two shapes and we'll just do minus front. Now that might not have been the ideal way to do it, but once we zoom back out and then re-enable the ellipse, maybe change the color to something like blue so we can see things a bit better, you won't even be able to notice it. All right, now this is where the reference icon comes back in. So we'll unlock it and then choose that as well as the ellipse, then re-enable the align to key object option. All right now you can see that our ellipse is the key object. So we'll just click align horizontally and align vertically as well. And then we'll grab the reference icon, bring it all the way at the top and we'll just scale it up just a little bit. And we'll lower the opacity to about 30% or so and then relock it. Now, the reason we're doing this is so we can use it as reference when we start cutting out these shapes inside of the X. So we'll go over to the rectangle tool. You can just click here and then drag over to the rectangle tool. And then let's zoom in. Oops, I have to reselect that. And just make sure we're snapped to like the center point of that tip. And we'll just click and drag that all the way up and then we'll extend it. So it covers pretty much the entire right side of the X shape there. Then let's duplicate it. So control C, control F, and then we'll just hit V and just click and drag this to the other side. Then let's shut these off. So we'll hit P to bring the pen tool. Now let's focus on recreating this shape here. So let's try to snap there. It doesn't have to be perfect. Something like that, let's zoom out, continue the mask and just make sure you go just a little bit outside of the bounds of the circle here and then close the shape. Now, instead of trying to recreate the exact same shape on the left side, what we can do is just select the path. We'll do control C, control F to paste and then select the second path as well as the ellipse and then go over to the flip horizontal option. And that way you just flip everything together on the left side and you have a perfectly symmetrical shape. Okay, now let's go ahead and turn them back on just to see which is which. Okay, this one is gonna be left top. This one is gonna be right top, right bottom. And this one is gonna be left bottom. Now at this point, I do wanna mention that instead of using the traditional method of just saving this as an Illustrator file, importing it back into After Effects and then converting all of those into shapes, renaming again, da 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 da. I will be using Overlord, which is a third party paid tool, but trust me, it's completely worth it because it just allows you to select layers you wanna send over and just click this button and you're pretty much done. So here, I'll show you. We can select bottom one, hold down shift, select the top one and just click push selection to After Effects. How cool is that? Now, before we continue with After Effects, I just wanna take a moment to thank today's sponsor, Envato Elements. This video is sponsored by Envato Elements. Envato provides a huge library of creative assets such as graphic elements and templates, stock footage, music, sound effects, fonts, and much more. On top of that, it offers unlimited downloads with an affordable subscription. So if you're interested, I have provided a link down below in the description, which will take you to their website. And of course, if you do decide to register, I get to earn a commission. All right, first things first, let's go ahead and shut off all the letters and also the inside parts. Then we'll rename this one to X cutout and we'll use the X cutout as a mat to cut a hole in the middle. We actually have to invert it. So click to invert the mat. Now let's take care of the inner parts by duplicating the circle and we'll call it circle inner mat. Re-enable all the inside parts, bring them below that layer and then we'll go ahead and use it as an alpha mat. Now I do wanna shut off the alpha mat for the circle inner mat. We don't need that. And then let me just change the color of these so we can see more clearly what's going on. Because the circle, like the original one, the blue one that you're seeing right now is being cut out by the X cutout layer, we get to reveal what's underneath. And what do we have underneath? Well, all of the inside parts. 
and those inside parts are being isolated to the circle. Now real quick, I'll check the transparency grid just so I can show you a, uh, an issue we have right now, which is this halo around the circle wherever we have the inner parts present. So you can see if I move that around. So a quick fix for that is to just select the circle inner mat, hit S to bring up the scale. Then we'll click on the scale value and hold down control and use the arrow keys to scale it down in 0.1 increments. And we'll go down just enough so we don't see that aliasing issue anymore. So maybe 99.6% is fine. And there you go. If I just toggle these shapes on and off, we don't get to see any of those bleeding edges. Now let's go over to the reference folder and I'll bring in the same icon that I had in Illustrator, maybe scale it down a bit, put it on the side. And now we're gonna go ahead and start setting up the gradients. So we'll select the circle, like the main one, and then go over to the fill color, hold down Alt and then click to cycle through fill type options as it says right over there. So we'll do that once. And now we have a linear gradient. Now I do wanna hold down control and click on the arrow to just reveal everything down here. On the gradient fill, we have the start and end point, which we can also control by clicking on them over here. But I do wanna be precise. So on the X, we'll just do zero and then click and drag that at the top and then click the start point at the bottom. And then you can click edit gradient. And let's say for the first one, which one is this? This one is at the bottom. We'll do something a bit darker and then for the other one, we'll just do pure white. I'm trying to create sort of like an illusion as if light is coming from above. Now I'll turn off the transparency grid just so we can see things a bit more clearly. Maybe even drag this up a little bit more, trying to focus more on this one. Um, actually, right now I'm noticing that this shape or like this bottom part is actually brighter. So we could have done the reverse. By the way, you hold down shift so that it snaps vertically. So it doesn't go on the sides like that. Or you could also just use the values down here. Now we'll do another thing just to give it a bit more definition. We'll go over to the effects and presets panel, search curves and just click and drag that onto the circle and we'll darken it down a bit. And then we'll shut it off just for a moment, grab the ellipse tool and also make sure you switch to tool creates mask as opposed to tool creates shape because we wanna add a mask on this shape layer. So we'll click on that and then just aim at the center here, click and drag and hold down control shift. And then we can go over to V, which is the selection tool, double click on the mask and we'll bring it up something like that. And then what I'll do is down here, we'll go over to effects, curves, compositing options. And you see this plus symbol, we wanna click on that and then make sure you reference the mask that we just created. And this way you were able to isolate these effects to a specific mask. Now we do wanna set this to subtract and then let's see, and then hit F to feather this a bit, just to give it a bit more definition. And by the way, you can hit Control Shift H to toggle the UI elements so you can see things a bit more clearly. All right, now let's focus on the inner part. So we'll start with the left bottom one, hold down Alt, click on that to switch to a gradient. So we'll just now use these uh, points. Hold down control and click again to reveal the properties down here and then hit on the edit gradient. And now for the first color, we'll just pick these from the uh, reference image. So let's do that and that. I believe we have to flip these. Yep, oops. See, sometimes you click away and then once you select the layer, you don't get those points back. So just make sure you click on the gradient fill effect and those points will pop back up. And then you can also play around with the color stop and end. And we'll go ahead and do the same for the other parts as well. One cool thing about After Effects is that it remembers the last colors you used. It gave me the same color. So now all I have to do is just adjust the positioning of these and then tweak the points, something like that. Another issue we have right here is the dark line right in the middle here. And that's because the two top shapes aren't quite intersecting with each other. So let's just select one of them. So the left top and we'll do one pixel to the right. It's like the right one and then one pixel to the left. And there you go. We have the icon pretty much ready to go. Next up, let's go ahead and add some more definition to the outside parts. And the way we can do that is by duplicating the X cutout. So let's just go ahead and do that. This is the X shape. And then we'll do one more time and we'll rename the bottom one to X cutout inner shadow. As for the top one, we'll do X cutout inner shadow matte. 
Okay, that's a long name, but whatever. It's always good to label these layers and also color code them so you can tell which is which. And what I wanna do is set the bottom one to be an alpha mat of the top one and then invert it. And now if we solo it, it effectively cuts itself out, leaving us with just this sort of outline shape. And on the top one, we'll search for fast box blur, add that in and we'll increase it to about 10 or 15%. You see what's happening, we get this sort of inner shadow, and then we do wanna switch this over to be completely black. We'll unsolo it, and now we have this sort of inner shadow, but it is a bit too in your face, if I can say that. So let's go ahead and maybe switch this over to overlay or something. Okay, that works a bit better. Uh, maybe even increase the blur, about 15%. That's before, that's after. It's looking a lot like ambient occlusion in a way, you know, it's giving it a lot of 3D depth, so to say. Now we do wanna bring this underneath the circle, but then above everything else. So it still affects the inner parts, but it doesn't necessarily affect the circle at the top. By the way, if we turn this off, <laughs> there's a complete mess downstairs, but nobody can see it. All right, now let's zoom out a bit. We'll shut off the reference icon, maybe fit this to the screen, and let's go ahead and create a new background. So let's go over to layer, new, solid, Call is BG for background. Color doesn't matter because we're gonna be using the gradient ramp effect. And we'll switch this to a radial ramp. Click swap colors. And then on the end color, let's just do something like, um, we can even pick it from here, something like that. And then for the top one, we'll do a brighter one. So let's see, something, something, something like that. And then remember, Control Shift H to hide or unhide the UI elements so we can see the points. And then hold down shift and click and drag down. Maybe we'll bring the top point upwards. Let's also create another solid and we'll call this shadow BG. We'll make the color black, hit okay, bring it at the bottom and then select the ellipse tool and we'll actually double click on it which will create a perfect ellipse based on the comp size. And then double click on it and then just do this, maybe drag it up a bit and scale it. And just set the mask mode to subtract. Hit F, increase the feather, and then hit T to bring up the opacity, maybe lower it down a bit, just so we give it a bit more definition at the bottom there. Now to add some more definition to the top, we'll do the reverse, so we'll do highlight BG, and we'll set the color to white, hit OK, and this time we'll mask that top side and then feather it. And this time we'll set the blending mode to overlay, and maybe even lower the opacity a bit. And then finally, we'll select the highlight BG because if we do that and then hit layer, new adjustment layer, it will create layers on top of the currently selected layer. That's a quick hack for you. I will do BGCC for background color correction and then search for curves, add that. Sorry if I'm going a bit too quickly right now, but just for the sake of the tutorial, you know, we gotta move things along. And then we'll add the CC vignette effect. First of all, we'll pin the highlights so we know for sure it doesn't affect the highlights and then maybe tone down the amount a bit. Now you may be noticing, I don't know how this looks like on YouTube, maybe it's completely trash because of the compression, but there's some banding going on here and the reason is because we're working in eight bits per channel. Let me actually first zoom in here. So hold down Alt and then click to go to 16 and then click again to go to 32. And now the banding has pretty much disappeared. I say that, but on YouTube, you could still be seeing banding lines. Nothing we can do about that. All right, now let me just select all of these and we'll switch those to brown color, that's background. We'll shy them and then turn on the global shy button, which will hide all of those layers. Let's also color code the letters to red. This one is just X and also shy those. All right, I think we're pretty much ready to start animating at this point. We'll go ahead and create a new null object, which is gonna be our control. So everything will be parented to this null object and we'll animate the null object itself. First things first, let me go to the circle, hit P, bring up the position, and then we'll copy it and then paste it to the null. That way the null jumps to the center of the circle. Then we'll parent everything to it. So select the top one, hold down shift, select the bottom one, and then parent those to the control null. Let's first focus on the ball as a whole. So we'll select the control null, hit P, bring up the position, set a keyframe there, and we'll move it over and then we'll go over it on the timeline as well, set a keyframe here. And for this keyframe, we'll go ahead and align it to the center horizontally. Then we'll go back even more and then click on it, hold down shift to snap vertically and just move it down so it's off screen. Now you may have noticed that these points got these Bezier handles and now we're gonna get this sort of curved motion, which we don't want. So select all of the keyframes, 
right click keyframe interpolation and switch the spatial interpolation to linear. And that will fix the issue. Now we have these linear movements. I also wanna animate the scale. So select the control null, hold down shift and press S to reveal the scale while also keeping the position visible. Then we'll go over to the second keyframe, set a keyframe there and we'll go down and then also set this to zero. So I want it to scale up from the bottom as well as come upwards. Another thing I wanna do is move forward a bit more here, select this keyframe, control C to copy, and then control V to paste. So we have this moment right here where nothing happens. And then once we have this sort of pause, then we can move over to the side and have all the letters reveal themselves. Now let's tweak the timing. So we'll select these keyframes, click and drag them and hold down shift to snap them to the start. And then we'll go to the beginning. And if you wanna scrub through the timeline frame by frame, you can click page down to go forward and then page up to go backwards. And if you hold down shift while doing so, you can go forwards and backwards by 10 frames each. So let's go over to 30 frames, which in this case is half a second, because remember, we're using 60 frames per second for our composition. And then we'll bring these over to half. And then let's say do another half a second of just nothing going on. And then we'll go over to maybe two seconds. Now, if we preview this, everything is linear. So, you know, it kind of looks like garbage. So this is where easing comes in. First of all, we'll select all of them, hit F9 to turn them into eased keyframes. And you can see the difference now. Everything is a bit more smooth right now, but it's still a bit too harsh for my eyes. So let's tweak the easing. And the way we can do that is if we select the scale, click on the graph editor, that will reveal the keyframes. And now if we click on any of them, we can see these handles. So what we can do is just click on this one, hold down shift to snap it and just drag it to the side. And then if we select the position, you may notice that even though you're clicking on the position values, you don't get those Bezier handles. The reason is because that's just how After Effects works. What we have to do to work around that is to right click on the position and then click separate dimensions. And now we're able to hit F9 to ease those and we can control the easing for the X and Y individually. So let me just select all of those keyframes right away. Hit F9 and I'll do P and I'll select only the Y position. And now when I click on the handle, you can notice that this left one and the right one are moving independent from each other, which in this case we don't want. So to fix that, we can right click keyframe interpolation and under temporal interpolation, we can switch that over to continuous Bezier instead. And that way, whatever we do to the right one, the left one is also gonna follow along. So the reason I did that is because I want this um, position animation to have a sort of overshoot. So you can see it comes into place, but it kind of goes over because I dragged it a bit further down and then it comes back to its position. Now for this one, we're gonna hit F9 and then drag this over while holding down shift. So it's a very smooth landing. And for this one, I can actually just hit F9, kind of do that. It just goes straight down. We could possibly bring these over. So it's a bit faster, something like that. The animation part is where you get to have, I would say the most fun, but also the most time consuming part as well. Because it's just a matter of tweaking the keyframes and the easing just to get it to look how you want it to. Now, I do wanna select the X position and just make sure that these two keyframes, they just start over a bit later, so phew. And now let's choose both of those keyframes, hit F9 to easy ease them. And I just wanna drag these like crazy. Oh, for some reason, yeah, I could just notice that. For some reason, it's not in the center. So to quickly fix that, just make sure that this keyframe is set to 960, which is the center of the comp in a 1920 composition. There you go, that's looking pretty slick. All right, so now let's focus on adding all of those splashy details like the circles and the X slice. Let's make sure that first nothing is selected so that when we grab the pen tool and go ahead and draw a rough mask, kind of like that, we will get a new shape layer. And let's go down under the contents. We wanna delete the fill, but then leave the stroke. And then we can increase the stroke width until it somewhat covers that inner part. And then under taper, we can increase the start length as well as the end length to get this sort of line that you would see in like Fruit Ninja or what was that game called? And at this point we can go back up and maybe increase the stroke width until that inner part, oops, until that inner part is covered. Maybe increase it just a little bit more. 
We could even drag it across like so. And now we'll just rename this to slice X left and then control D to duplicate and we'll do right and just hit S, unlink the X and Y and then we'll do minus 100 on the other one. Now, sure, we might need to just reposition it just a little bit and maybe even select both of them and move them up a bit as well. And now let's double click on the ellipse tool to create a perfect ellipse. Let's go down under the ellipse path and we'll set the size to something like 512 by 512, so it's not as large. And we'll also delete the stroke. The color doesn't really matter because we're gonna be using this as the slice mat which is gonna reveal these two slice layers. So select both of them, alpha mat them to the circle. And this way, when we scale this down, you can see it affects the visibility of those slices. Now we do wanna make sure that this goes a bit up, just so we're on the center of this sort of shape right here. And that way the X kind of formulates from that point. Now let's just scale it up just enough so that we cover both of the lines and then hit S, set a keyframe on the scale, go back a bit, and then we'll just set this down to zero. Now we just gotta find the point in which we want this to occur. So maybe on the keyframe where the Y position ends, we can hold down shift and page, de uh, page up, sorry, to go backwards by 10 frames, and then just bring this keyframe over and then go over by maybe 20 frames and just bring this over. Okay, I may want to F9 this and then go over to the graph editor and just make sure I pump this upwards. So as soon as the circle pops up, it's already quite big, so we can even increase this a bit more. Now, I do also want to make sure that these slices follow the control null. So just make sure you're sitting at some point in time where nothing is happening and then parent these over to the control null. Now, at this point, we want to also make the slice disappear from the center. So it kind of goes like whoop, and then whoop, from the center, they disappear. We'll select the slice mat and then select the ellipse tool and make sure you're using the tool creates mask option just as we did before. Try to roughly align it with this anchor point. Click, hold down control and shift and just create a mask. Then we'll hit M, set a keyframe, move backwards just a little bit and then double click on the mask and scale it down so it's very tiny. And what I'll do is hit U on the slice mat and let's say 10 frames after the scale kicks in. So shift page down that's when the subtracted mask comes in, which cuts out the slices. And what I'll do is maybe do one, two, 20 frames. And then of course we have to like scale this all the way up until everything disappears. And one more thing I wanna do just for safety is go back by one frame and then select the mask, hit Control T to transform it, and then zoom out a lot, just hold down Shift and go over to the left with the left arrow key. That way we know for sure there's no gap inside of there. We could also go right over here where we start seeing the slices, hold down shift, select all of these layers and then alt open square bracket to trim them there. And then go over here where we no longer see them after that point and then alt close square bracket so that we know this is how long all of those slice layers last. All right, now let's also take care of the circle wipes. So that's very simple, double click on the ellipse go down, make sure this is a perfect ellipse. So we'll do 1000 by 1000 and we'll delete the fill and just leave the stroke. We'll increase the stroke just a little bit. Let's say 75 or something like that. Let's see, hit S, scale it down. That's a bit too much. By the way, you can select the layer and then search for stroke width, which will reveal that property instead of having to go down a bunch of menus. Scale it down to about 35, nope, 25, and we'll do circle wipe. Then hit S, set a keyframe for the scale, set it to zero, and let's move forward by maybe 20 frames and set it to 50. Let's now go back to the stroke width and set a keyframe for that. Hit U to reveal all of the keyframes on a layer, and we'll bring this over to the first keyframe. And on the last one, where the scale is all the way up to 50%, we want this to go down to zero. And that way we get this sort of and kind of disappears. F9 this one, and maybe even go to the graph editor and just drag it over a bit. Now the timing isn't quite right, so let's just do that. 
We will have the circle pop up a bit sooner. And of course, we have to reposition this. So let's say bring it up here. And also make sure that this is parented to the control node. Now I also want to duplicate the circle wipe and offset it by five frames. And on this one, I want the stroke width to be a bit thicker. So we'll do 50 and then we'll do one more time, duplicate, but this time we'll do 75 and then offset it by five frames. One, two, three, four, five. So we get this sort of ripple effect. Now let's go ahead and take care of the inside cutout part. So we'll search for the matte choker effect, click and drag that onto it. And now as we increase the choke, you can see how the shape gets choked out. Uh, we can also increase the geometric softness to about 20 or so, but we do get this sort of issue where the edges are a bit faded. So we'll leave the gray level softness one to about 1% and then set a keyframe for all three of these. Hit U and then hold down Shift, hit S to bring up the scale as well. And we'll set a keyframe for the scale. Now, before we move forward with anything, let's hit Y to bring up the anchor point tool and then click on the anchor point and hold down Shift, snap it vertically and just make sure you put it right there in the middle of that X shape. And this way, when you scale it down, it scales down from that point. So let's uh, move forward a bit. Maybe let's say one, two, three, set a keyframe for all of those. And then one, two, three, uh, we'll set the scale down to just enough until that shape disappears. And then go over to the end keyframe. And then we'll set the choke one to zero and the geometric softness down to zero as well. Another thing we have to do is increase the geometric softness back up to 100%, but we don't want that to start at the beginning. We actually just want it to go back by five frames. So one, two, three, four, five backwards, bring this over here, maybe even F9 on those. And then what we could do is hit F9 on all of these, select them all, go over to the graph editor and just drag the easing like so. That way we get a very quick expansion. But we also want to make sure that these keyframes come in right after the slice happens. So maybe we can have the expansion start to happen at that point. Now let's give it a bit more interest by selecting the slice layers and the circle wipes and maybe switch the blending mode to overlay. Another thing you might've noticed is because we're sort of choking the shape, the bottom left and the bottom right shapes are not aligning anymore. So you can see this line here has to be on this corner, but it's not anymore because the shape is being choked. So what we can do to counter that is to just, let's say, select these left and right bottom shapes and search for path, set a keyframe on those, and then move backwards a bit. Let's see, where do we have it? Maybe at this point, just so we can see them. Toggle the visibility of the masks, hit G, and then click and drag this over there. Maybe we can do something like that. And then do the same thing over here. Let's see, is that symmetrical? Let's just drag these over, hit F9 on those, and go over to the graph editor. Make sure you drag the influence over a bit. Yeah, that just compensates a little bit for the choke. Now, another thing we have to do is go back to the cutout inner shadow mat. So this one that we're using for the inner shadow and make sure that we add the set mat effect, bring it above the fast box blur and choose the original X cutout with effects and masks. Let me just solo it for a moment and disable the fast box blur so you can see what's happening. We're using the original X cutouts shape as an alpha mat to isolate this shape. Hopefully that made sense. If I go very slowly here, you can see how the shadow is affecting it. Whereas if we were to turn that off, the shadow is only visible on the edges there and not on the middle. Now let's go ahead and create the rays that you see inside of the X shape. So we'll go ahead, layer, new, solid, and we'll call this rays. Color doesn't matter, hit OK. And we'll search for fractal noise, click and drag that onto the solid. And we'll go ahead and just increase the contrast a bit to about 300 or so. Then under transform, we'll uncheck the uniform scaling option. And this way we can tweak the scale width and height independent from each other. Now it does cap at 600 if you use this slider. But if you click on the number and then just click and drag, you can actually go over that. So let's say about 3000 or something like that. 
and then decrease the width. The lower you go, you get to introduce more rays, if you will. So let's say about 25. Now to give this some life, we can animate the evolution value by either setting a keyframe, move forward and then cycling this through, which is manual work and I don't wanna do that. So we can use an expression by alt clicking on the evolution stopwatch and just type in time times 200. And this way it will cycle by 200 degrees every second. So if we go at second one, you'll see it's 200. Now, let me go ahead and hit S, we'll scale this down. And I'll also find a point in time where that circle is right in the middle. And we'll set this to add, so we get rid of the dark lines. Now you may still notice these dark lines and that's gotta do with the overflow mode. So let's just switch over to clip. Let's bring it up top here and make sure it's covering the entire circle. Now let's parent this to the control null so that it follows along. And we'll move forward in time until we no longer see any of those annoying circle wipes and slices and dices. And now we'll select the raise layer, double click on the ellipse tool, and then we'll scale it down, kind of isolate it just to that center area. And then hit F, feather it out. Now I do wanna isolate it just to the cutout part. So we'll track mat the X cutout right there. Maybe even bring it over here at the bottom. So now the rays are only present inside of the X shape. We could also lower the opacity a bit. And then let's add a CC radial fast blur effect and we'll tweak the center point. Let's also switch the zoom mode to brightest and then increase this so it kind of blurs the lines a bit outwards. And then we'll also add the optics compensation effect, which in this case is very useful if we increase this and then also make sure we reverse the lens distortion. It kind of stretches out the rays. It helps with the three dimensionality of it all. And then right on top, I just wanna add a fast box blur effect and uh, let's say increase this to about five or so, just to blur those edges a bit. You could also tweak the optics compensation positioning. So something like that. And then maybe even decrease the opacity even more. Maybe increase the scale width. If you do that, you get to have less and less lines, but if you go lower, you get to introduce more detail. So I want to go about maybe 40 or so. Okay, that's looking very nice indeed. We could even increase the blur to about 10 even. And finally, I want the rays to come in as it goes on to the left side. So we'll set a keyframe here for the opacity. Go over here and uh, we'll do another keyframe, then click the arrow to go to the previous keyframe and set this to zero and also F9 to easy ease those. All right, well, there you go. That's the final animation for the icon. Of course, you could go in there and dial in the easing and all the properties if you want to, but for the sake of the tutorial, we're gonna move on to the text animation. So let's unhide the shide layers, re-enable all the letters and let's just set the fill color to white so we can see them and unshy them, but then re-enable the shy button so we don't see the background layers. And in fact, at this point, we could also just select all of these slice and dices, maybe just those, so we can hide those and have a more cleaner timeline. And then let's say go over to three seconds so we know the icon is in its final position and then parent all of those layers to the control null. Now we'll go ahead and duplicate the X letter and then hit G to bring up the pen tool. And what we'll do is actually divide this letter into two parts. So for this first copy, we'll leave only the left side of the letter. And for the first copy, we'll leave only the right side of the letter. So we'll delete those points. So now we have that and we have that. Then what we can do is select both of them, duplicate them and just move them over to the other letter. So we save ourselves some time. Remember, hold down shift as you're moving it to snap it horizontally. And then we'll delete this one because we don't need that. As for the O letter, we'll duplicate it, then hit G, double click on one of the shapes. So the inside shape, for example, and we'll delete that. Then double click on the outside shape and just make sure you scale it down until the shape kind of sits in the middle of the original O letter. And what we'll do is go down to the contents, delete the fill, and we'll add a stroke and let's say increase the stroke until it covers the entire original O letter and then use this layer as an alpha mat to reveal the original letter by using the trim paths effect and animating the end value or maybe the start value. Actually the end, but I wanna offset from where it starts. So let's say minus 180. Yep, there you go. So clockwise 
and it starts from the ground up. As for the B, that one is a bit more complicated, so we'll actually head over back to Illustrator, set it up there, and then bring it back into After Effects with Overlord so we can move on with the animation. I wanna go ahead and select the B letter and just Control C and then Control F three times so we have three copies because what I wanna do is have this left side of the letter be its own layer and then the right side of the letter be its own layer as well as this middle line be its own layer. So we're gonna have three shapes. So let's start off with the uh, left one and then hit A to bring up the direct selection tool which allows you to select the points. We'll grab those, delete them and then delete everything else as well. Oops, just make sure you don't grab the O letter. And let's say we also don't need those. And we'll grab this point, hold down shift, and uh, just go down until it snaps to that. And then hold down shift, go up until it snaps to that. And then hit P for pen tool. Click on that, click there, click there, and click there. Now you're left with this rectangle, basically. Now let's re-enable the other one. Let's say delete these two. We'll bring this over here, and then this over here, and then we'll close this with that, and then close this with that. And then finally, we'll delete everything apart from the middle shape. So let's say that, and then those. It's gonna be a bit chaotic. See, this to that, that to that, and this to this, and then you can just minus these ones in the middle. You don't need those. So there you go. If you re-enable everything back up, we have every single shape on its own layer. Now let's rename this one to B left, this one to B right, B right, and this one to B middle. Then let's target all of them and hit send to After Effects. We'll change the fill color to white, hit OK, and we'll bring them over right here. We don't need the original one actually, so we'll delete that and then recolor code these to red. All right, now let's start animating these. So we'll select the first letter, then we'll search for a linear wipe and we'll add that right in there. And let's say set this to 180 degrees. Let's see, is that the right direction? Yep, there you go. Now we do wanna hold control so we can tweak this value in 1% increments because this 100% is the percentage of the comp. So let's say 58%, this is gone. We set a keyframe there. Let's move forward by 20 frames and then control again and just make sure you drag it right up until you hit the top there. So let's say 43%. Now if you hit U and then F9 those, maybe we'll select the last one and then go over to the graph editor, we'll switch to the value graph and we'll just do that. So it's very snappy. And then instead of doing the same thing for all of these shapes, we'll just select the linear wipe effect, control C to copy, make sure you're on the first frame and then select this one, and then the other two, Control V to paste, and then we'll just trim all of them. Now I do wanna offset them by five frames, so we'll go one, two, three, four, five, and I want the left side to come in first, so we'll drag the right side, and we'll do one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, and this was an accident. On this X letter, this side comes in first, and then the other side comes in second. But that's actually a pretty cool little accident there. You know, we want some variation. Now let's take care of the O letter because that's easier than the B letter. And uh, let's see what we have here. Okay, we have to animate the star value. So we'll set a keyframe there and then go forward by 20 frames. Do that, F9, and then just drag the easing like so. Now for the B letter, first of all, we want the B left side. Let's just hit Y and we'll drag the anchor point tool, hold down control, which will snap it to these points. And we want it to snap to the bottom middle point. So now we can just do that. So let's hit S, set a keyframe. We'll go forward by 10 frames instead of 20. Set another keyframe and go back to the first keyframe. Unlink these so we can decrease the Y value to 0%, and then we'll move forward. Right as it hits that last keyframe, we want the right side to start kicking in. And for this, we'll actually use the same method as we did with the O letter. So let's just deselect it, click G, bring up the pen tool, click here somewhere, and then hold down Shift again, just to make sure you're going straight on. Then we'll click here, and then hold down Shift again. See how the curves are snapped vertically? Hold down Shift, drag the curve, and then hold down Alt. You can see how the icon switches. So you can drag that to this side, 
and then continue drawing the shape all the way to here. Now, we don't want this to be a fill. We want to use just the stroke, so we'll delete the fill. And then inside the stroke, we'll increase it until again, it covers the original shape. And we actually want this to go over here and this one as well, just so we're safe. And we'll do B right mat, drag this down. So we'll do B right alpha mat that, and then we'll add the trim paths effect. Drop this down. Let's see, we just have to animate that. Yeah, there you go. We'll set it to 0%. And we'll move forward by, let's say, one, two, three, and we'll go over to 100%. And for this one, we'll do F9, graph editor, and we'll just pump it up like that. And now we just need to go to the frame in which we have to start revealing the middle shape, and we'll go B middle. And for this, actually, I'll just animate the path. So search for path, set a keyframe there, disable the graph editor. And we'll go forward by maybe 10 frames or so. Set a keyframe there. I just wanna make sure that these are dragged just a bit to the right so we don't see that gap. You see that? Now you see it? Now you don't. And we'll go back. I'll actually delete that because of the adjustment we made on this keyframe. And then we'll just drag these over. We could do something fancy like just bring this over and then hit Control R to bring up the ruler so you can like set a line just to make sure that these two points are on the same line. And then also to get rid of these uh, Bezier handles, click G, hold down Alt, click on both of those, and now they are sharp lines. Now let's also select that F9, Graph Editor, and I will do that. Now we do want to trim it so it's not visible prior to that point. And we'll also trim the B letter as a whole. Okay, okay, maybe even the O letter. So go to that time, trim it there. And let me also change the color code of these. And now we know exactly at which point each letter comes in. So let's say go over here, one, two, three, four, five. We'll drag over the B letter and then let's move forward a bit. Have the O come in here. One, two, three, four, five. Hmm, there's a bit of a slowdown when the B letter starts coming in, especially the left side. So let's select the left layer, hit U, and then we'll just go one, two, three, four, five. So it doesn't take as long. That goes there, and this one goes there. And this way we can just drag this one, two, three, four, five. Also, let's now push these over in time just so that they start coming in as the icon pushes to the side. So let's see about here. All right, so the animation is complete, but I do wanna add a few final touches like some shading to the letters to make them look a bit more 3D as well as some post-processing effects to the whole scene. So we'll start by unparenting all of these layers and let's also drag them over to the end here, Alt, Close, Square, Bracket, and then go over to Layer, Pre-Compose, and we'll call this Xbox Letters, Tut. So we have all of those layers isolated to just a single layer. Now we'll reparent it to the Control, and next up we'll right-click, go over to Layer Styles, Inner Shadow, then we'll drop down to the inner shadow. I wanna tweak the angle to be minus 90. So the light looks like it's coming from above. And then we'll decrease the opacity a bit, maybe decrease the distance to about three or so, and maybe increase the softness by setting the size to 10. Let's see, before, after. We'll go over to layer, new adjustment layer, and we'll call this CC, set the color to something else. And we'll search for curves, add the curve effect, Give it some more contrast, something like that. Maybe we'll unshy these and then tone down the opacity for the shadow background layer. This way we can add contrast to the whole thing. Let's also duplicate the adjustment layer, but then delete the effect and we'll add a fast box blur and we'll set the intensity to about 10 and then switch the blending mode to lighten and then lower down the opacity a bit. You see, this is a quick and dirty way to uh, create glow effects. Let's say rename this and then we'll do glow broad, increase the radius a lot. So we have a softer glow, but then increase the opacity just a little bit. I'm also noticing how the circle is a bit too bright. So let's say add a tint effect, make both of the colors black, and then just tone down the amount to tint. Oh, and one more detail we could add is to duplicate the Xbox letters. And for the bottom one, 
will shut off the inner shadow or the layer styles as a whole. And then for the top one, we'll just offset it by five frames. So one, two, three, four, five. But for this one, we'll also set it to overlay. So you'll get this sort of double right in effect. All right, guys, so we finally reached the end of the episode. So thanks for watching and be patient all the way through. As I said at the beginning, this tutorial is part of an ongoing logo animation series. So make sure to leave a comment down below with your suggestions. And who knows, maybe you'll get featured in the future. Thank you once again for watching and I'll see you next time. Peace out.